Dallas Theological Seminary's Chapel Podcast. I have the privilege of introducing our speaker this morning. Dr. Bailey is here on campus. Uh, his voice is kind of under the weather, so he asked me to step in and introduce our speaker. <clears throat> Dr. John Morris is the president of the Institute for Christian Research. He received his doctorate in geological engineering at the University of Oklahoma in 1980. He served on the University of Oklahoma faculty before joining the Institute for Creation Research in 1984, holding the position of professor of geology before being appointed its president in 1996. Dr. Morris travels widely around the world speaking at churches, conferences, schools such as ours, and scientific meetings. His books and articles address scientific evidence that supports the Bible. Some books he has authored or co-authored include The Young Earth, The Modern Creation Trilogy, and most recently, The Fossil Record, Unearthing Nature's History of Life. He is perhaps best known for leading expeditions to Mount Ararat in search of Noah's Ark. Dr. Morris and his wife, Dalta, have three children, three grandchildren, and they reside in a suburb of Dallas. Would you welcome with me Dr. John Morris? Well, thank you, brother, and thank you all for that nice warm welcome. My goodness, Dallas Seminary. I have wanted for my whole Christian life to go to Dallas someday and learn what's being taught here. Uh, my, oh, my. Um, I've lusted after coming to Dallas Seminary. <laughs> and uh, yet, all I could do was go and get my PhD in geology and uh, think about those things. But I, you know, have been an elder in several churches and a Sunday school teacher and and preaching and stuff. I, I just want to learn what's being taught here. I envy you people. But, um, and I say to myself, what is there that I know that I could teach them? They know everything that I want to know. <laughs> well, I suspect that um, as president of the Institute for Creation Research, maybe we could talk about creation evolution a little bit and, uh, and uh, help equip you for for uh, ministry in that area too. So that's what we're going to do this morning. I want to address the, the, the general question, uh, is it legitimate for a Christian to believe in evolution? Now, I'm, I want to be very clear up front, I do not think you have to be a creationist to be a Christian. In fact, I'll, I know a lot of truly born-again Christians who are not creationists. They believe in evolution, just like Carl Sagan believed in evolution. And, and yet, um, is that legitimate? In fact, most people, when they first come to Christ, they come as an evolutionist. That's all they've ever been taught. They've they're been brainwashed in that, and they come as an evolutionist. You don't have to be a creationist to be a Christian. But my question is, once a person is a Christian, and once they have uh, embarked on this project of molding their thinking over to the things of the Lord, and um, being, giving attention to the Scriptures, is it legitimate to continue in that belief of evolution? Um, I think not, and I want to give you several reasons this morning why I think not. Um, the, uh, first off, though, we have to define terms, just to make sure we're communicating correctly. When, when I use the word evolution, I'm going to be using evolution like Darwin used the term evolution, the idea that all of life goes back to a common ancestor. Evolution is not variety among things. The cocker spaniel and the beagle, that's not evolution, that's variety, that's adaptation. Uh, many times when you ask an evolutionist, give me some evidence for evolution, they'll say, well, look at all the different breeds of dogs. Well, yeah, they're all dogs and they're different breeds and they're different, but that's not evolution. That's got nothing to do with evolution. Now, a dog and a cat, that might have something to do with evolution. They would say that all of these animals go back to a common ancestor that there was a common ancestor of dogs and cats, and it split, and, and there, it's through the missing link idea. Uh, you know what a missing link is, don't you? 
They talk about the missing link as between man and the apes. Well, yeah, there's a missing link there, but between apes and their ancestors, there's a missing link, and between all the different animals, there's a missing link. And, and of course, mammals came from the rodents, and the rodents came from the reptiles, and the reptiles came from the amphibian, and the amphibian came from the fish, and the fish came from the starfish, and, and all of these big transitions requires missing links. Well, that's you, you do know what a missing link is. Um, I don't either. Um, <laughs> the reason you don't know what a missing link is is because it's missing. For crying in the bucket, it's missing. It's just not there. Evolution demands trillions of missing links, and they don't have any. Missing links are missing. That's the point. Well, so when I say evolution, I'm talking about big changes. Not these little adaptations. I'm talking about a fish becomes a person or a frog becomes a prince. I mean, these are big changes. Evolution says that happened. But, uh, of course, they wave the magic wand of time over it. But um, I don't think frogs ever become a prince. I think that's a very unscientific idea. I, I'm against evolution on scientific grounds as well as biblical grounds. Well, so when I say evolution, I'm talking about those big changes, not these small little bitty changes. When I say creation, I'm talking about biblical creation. I'm talking about the Bible is correct. The Bible is a history book. It's a, it's a story about what God actually did, and He created all things in six days, like today, evidently, and that's what the Bible says, and that's what I believe, and that's how I'm going to be using the term creation here this morning. Evolution is this idea of descent from a common ancestor. Evolution is the idea that each basic category got here by direct creation uh, after that kind and uh, not very long ago, evidently. Um, so th th this other term, theistic evolution, uh, is it, that's what we're asking. Is it legitimate for a Christian, a born-again Christian, to be a theistic evolution, evolutionist who claims that God used the concept of evolution to create? That was His method of creation. Well, I think not. And I want to give you uh, at least two reasons, and if I have time, I'll get to three, um, but two reasons. First reason, the first reason that a Christian ought not to believe in evolution. If you take a note, this is the first reason. The first reason that evolution, that a Christian ought not to believe in evolution, this may not be the most important reason. It's just the first one on my list, all right? The first reason that a Christian ought not to believe in evolution is that evolution didn't happen. It didn't happen. Christians ought to believe in true things, and evolution is not true. Evolution in any sense is not true. You did not come from a fish, as evolution insists. In fact, there's a textbook in use out in California that says we came from a fish. Fish was the first vertebrate, the first animal with a vertebrate, vertebrae, and that we are descended from that. In fact, they classify humans as a special category of bony fish. That's evolution with a vengeance. But evolution did not happen. Now, let me, uh, let me explainify that a little bit. Um, I just moved to Texas and I learned a new word. Uh, uh, let, me, let me explainify that. When I say evolution didn't happen, um, well, evolution certainly isn't happening today. I mean, people are looking, hunting for it, hunting for some evidence that it's happening, and, and they see adaptation, they see variety, they see brown eyes and blue eyes, but that's got nothing to do with evolution. Evolution of one basic category into another basic category, that doesn't seem to be happening today. And by the way, science has to do with this concept of observation. That's what scientists do, is make their observations. They study whatever they're studying. They do their experiments. They collect their fossils. They do their calculations. I mean, scientists observe things and then make some inferences based on their observations. Did you know that nobody, nobody, nobody even claims to have observed evolution? They see adaptation, they see variety, they see different traits, but nobody sees one basic type changing into another basic type. Um, they don't see it. What they observe is what science calls stasis, that things stay the same. They're stationary. Um, 
they observe stasis, they tell a story about big changes. They say, well, evolution goes too slow to observe. Well, that's convenient because we don't observe it. The fact is we don't observe it. They say, well, it happened in the past, back before anybody was here to observe. Well, that's convenient too. Uh, the fact is we don't observe it. We, don't, we, we do have a record of life in the past, and that's the fossil record. Uh, and when we start looking at the fossils, you know what we see? Well, in the present world, we see all these different categories, dogs and cats and horses and fish and, you know, the different categories of fish. And, you know, there, there are different categories. We can, we can categorize the animals that we see. But we don't see anything in between. But when we look in the fossil record, we see exactly the same categories that are alive today. We see the same categories. We see some categories that have gone extinct. But extinction is not evolution. That's the opposite of evolution. We're losing things, not getting new things. Uh, what we observe is extinction and stasis. They say, well, it's, you know, the evolution doesn't happen in the present. And from looking at the fossils, we get the impression that it didn't happen in the past. Because what we see in the past is exactly the same thing that we see today, the same categories of things. We see some extinct varieties of things. We see cats in the fossil record. We see some extinct cats, like the saber-toothed tiger. But that's, you know, it's, we can categorize it. We know what that is. Where is the missing link? We don't see them in the fossil record. Did you know that you could count, uh, you could count the missing links? There are only a few that they even claim, but they're, they're really not true missing links the in-between forms of one type of animal changing into another, we don't see those in-between forms. We don't see the missing links. They say, well, evolution works by this concept of mutations and natural selection, and mutations happen today. Well, mutations certainly do happen today. In fact, I hate to tell you this, but you all have undergone mutations since you've been sitting here this morning. Um, you're all mutants. but. Um, Interestingly enough, the human body and the cells are so incredibly well designed, so amazingly potent that when a mutation happens, that the cell, the, the mechanisms in the cell, they, they search out that mutation and they, and they heal it, they, they mend it, they fix it back together again. Uh, everything about the cell is is designed to see that these kinds of changes don't happen. Well, if a mutation happens in a reproductive cell, it might pass on to the next generation. Most of the cells just do with aging. Uh, most of the cell mutations do with aging and disease. But unless the cell fixes them, but those that are passed on to the next generation, they might be, well, evolution needs helpful mutations needs innovative mutations. To take a, fur, a fish and turn it into a person, you've got to have a lot of helpful changes. You've got to have new organs, new body parts, new physiology. It's just a lot of new stuff that a fish doesn't have. A fish doesn't have a lung or a leg. And yet, in order for a fish to evolve into an amphibian, it's got to get the genes through mutations for legs and limbs and, and, and lungs. Um, these would be called beneficial mutations. Do you know how many beneficial mutations science has ever seen? Really beneficial mutations that actually added information to the genome that made it bigger and better and can do more and different things. You could count the number of beneficial mutations on the fingers of one hand, even if you're a mutant and don't have any fingers. I mean, they don't have any. They don't have any that really added new information to the genome. They have a lot that have altered the, gener the information that's there, messed up the genes that are functioning, but new genes they don't have. Uh, the one that they always use in the, in the um, textbooks is the genetic mutation called sickle cell anemia. You've heard of that. Uh, if you, it's a very painful and often fatal condition, but it's been noted that down in Africa, that if you happen to be dying of sickle cell anemia, you have a slightly higher chance of surviving malaria. 
And that's the best example of an evolutionary mutation. They say, that proves you came from a fish. No, it doesn't. But that's the best one. Evolution is kind of like, uh, you know, the emperor's new clothes. Everybody says they see the evidence for it, but they really don't because it's not there. You ask them for it and they give you beagles and cocker spaniels, but they just don't have the evidence for evolution. They've been telling a story and telling it so long and so often that people are intimidated into believing it. Well, Christians ought not to be intimidated into believing it because evolution didn't happen. Doesn't happen in the present, didn't happen in the past, can't happen. The, the natural laws of science are against it. And it certainly can't explain the incredible design and complexity we see in living things. Even a, a simple cell, a single cell organism, simple cell, that's a contradiction in terms. Uh, cells, even a single cell organism is not simple. If it's living, it's complex. There's no such thing as simple life. But there are some forms of life more simple than other forms of life. And a single cell organism is less complex than a person. But even a single cell organism, if you look at it through engineering eyeballs, if you, if you look at the complexity there, a single cell organism is more complicated, more engineered, more designed than a supercomputer. And while well, evolution may say that got here by chance, but I got to tell you, supercomputers don't get here by an explosion at Radio Shack. I mean, it just doesn't happen that way. Somebody designed and created that computer, and, um, well, evolution didn't happen. Doesn't happen, can't happen, can't explain what we see. That's reason number one. Reason number two is that the Bible says it happened a different way. In fact, the Bible very specifically says that God did not take one type of animal and change it into another type of animal. The Bible says it happened a different way. In fact, in Genesis chapter 1, uh, let's, let's go back there and just refresh our memories on, on what that says there. Genesis chapter 1, on day 1, God creates the heavens and the earth, and He creates light. And then day 2, the oceans and the atmosphere. Day 3, the continents were formed, and then plant life on the continents. Let's look at day 3. Uh, starting in verse 11, God said, let the earth bring forth, the earth, that's the dry land, bring forth grass and the herb yielding seed and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself. And, and so God, verse 12, did bring forth these things. The earth did bring forth after his kind. Look at that phrase, after his kind. It's used twice in verse 12 and once in verse 11 for these different types of, of plants. Uh, the, the same phrase occurs again in, on day 5, starting in verse 21, when God creates life in the oceans and birds that fly. Uh, look at verse 21. God created these great ocean creatures and every living creature that moves, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after its ki his kind. God saw that it was good. Look down in, on day 6 and verse 24. And then God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature, the, the dry land. The, the, these creatures live on land. He said, let the, the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, and the cattle and the creeping things of the earth, and the beast of the earth after his kind, and it was so. And verse 25, God did make the, uh, the, the beast of the earth after his kind, and the cattle after their kind, and the creeping things after their kind. It says that phrase ten times in those few verses. Ten times. It's repeated. Now, if Scripture repeats a, something, you know, says it once, it's important. If it repeats it, it's really important. If it says it ten times in just a few verses, he's trying to make a point. What evolution says that some basic kind got transmorphed into another kind, that, that things came from another kind through these missing links, that the descent from a common ancestor model. The Bible doesn't say that evolution is impossible, it, but it does specifically say that evolution of one into another was specifically not the mechanism that God used to create. He created things after their kind, and He said it ten times so we wouldn't get it wrong. Unfortunately, many of our Bible colleges and, and, and all are just absorbed in this atheistic evolution idea. And they don't get it. It's so very plain here. Well, I don't think fish turn into people or frogs into princes. I don't think that happens even in a trillion years. That'll never happen. 
Uh, we, we see no evidence scientifically that it could happen or that it did happen. And the Bible says it happened another way. Third reason is that if we were to blame God for the concept of evolution, I think that denigrates his character. I think the concept of, the God of the Bible would never use the concept of evolution. Evolution is all about this idea of natural selection. No, God is a supernatural God. God uses supernatural processes. He's not locked into just natural processes. Sure, surely he uses natural processes probably most of the time, but he's not locked into using them. And this issue is about origins, about how things came to be in the first place, not how that they continue and operate on a daily basis. Uh, things, how did they get here? Well, the God of the Bible says he created them after their kind. He spoke and it was so. But survival of the fittest the whole idea behind survival of the fittest, it's not so much survival of the fittest, it's mainly having to do with the extinction of the unfit. That's the whole purpose behind survival of the fittest. In fact, Darwin's book, Origin of Species, the last paragraph of that book, Origin of Species, the last paragraph, the concluding paragraph, he says, thus we see that from the war of nature, from death and disease and extinction has come man. Death has brought man. Would God use this concept of extinction and death and disease and suffering and carnivorous activity to bring about man, his own very image? I think not. And I think if we blame God for that, if we say that's how God did it, we, we just insult him. This is not the God that's revealed in Scripture. Something different was going on. God created. He, you know, he, he made Adam in his own image, uh, specifically uh, did not come from the lower animals. And besides, um, where in that concept of evolution, this idea of carnivorous activity and the might, the, the strong uh, cause the, the weak to go extinct and the might makes right, this whole thing, where is the, the concept of God's love in this? Uh, where's His grace? Where? Um, it seems to me that the concept of survival of the fittest is more in tune with the concept of salvation by works, whereas God operates on salvation by grace. I mean, it's just, it's just incompatible with the nature of God. And in fact, the whole concept of evolution is incompatible with the very core of the gospel, the salvation message, the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. You see, if evolution is true, if evolution is true and that over the millions and hundreds of millions of years has been living and dying and going extinction, going extinct and mutations and natural selection, if that's been happening for hundreds of millions of years long before man got here, then in fact evolutionists will say that it was the death of the dinosaurs, the extinction of the dinosaurs which gave rise to the mammals and finally man. Death has brought man. Well, what does the Bible say? The Bible say that in the beginning God created things very good. They were perfect, in, in tune with His holiness and His perfection. And yet that was interrupted by man's rejection of God as authority and his rebellion against Him. Well, rebellion is sin, and the Bible specifically says that the wages of sin is death. And all around us we see a creation that is not very good. This creation is locked in this principle of death and decay. The whole creation groans and travails in pain together until now because of the presence of sin and its penalty death. Man brought death. Evolution says death brought man. These are opposite concepts. Now, I know a lot of Christians believe in evolution, but Christians, please understand what evolution is all about. Evolution is a very ungodly and unchristian concept and un a process that, that just is incompatible with the character of God. And it, if evolution is true and death was here for millions of years before Adam, before Adam sinned, if death was here before sin, then death could not be the penalty for sin because death was here before sin. And friends, if death is not the penalty for sin, then what in the world good did the death of Jesus Christ accomplish? You see the problem? It's not illegitimate for a Christian to believe in, well, it's not, you don't have to be a creationist to be a Christian. 
but it is illegitimate for it. It is impossible that if evolution in any sense is true, for Christianity to be true. Evolution is the opposite of evolution, of, of, what did I just say? Evolution is the opposite of Christianity. Uh, They are completely different worldviews. Christians ought to have a proper worldview. Christians ought to believe in true things, and evolution is not a true thing. 